See you, we can hear you. I apologize. Uh, our last interview took a little longer than was expected, so sorry about that. No problem. Congratulations on your 10th anniversary. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to try and turn you around here so you can see the audience. One second. So we'll, we'll get started right away here. If you wouldn't mind, uh, we, we can start with your time at Mattel and what you were involved with there, including the handheld electronic games and uh, uh, everything uh, wonderful that you did for Mattel. Okay. Uh, I got a call one day when I was working at an ad agency, Board Stiff in San Francisco, and asked if I wanted to be in charge of new product category marketing at Mattel, which meant getting them into new categories they had never been in before and or trying to succeed in categories that they had failed in, like toy trucks, traditional games, that kind of thing. So uh, I was assigned a lot of design groups to work with, and uh, we did research. We had concepts for new products, and one day I had the concept to try to come up with uh, a game the size of a miniature calculator. Remember, that was a hot electronic item way back then, miniature handheld calculators. So I asked Richard Chang, who was in charge of our preliminary design group, handling electronics, which was a new area at Mattel, if he could design a game based on LED technology and make it the size of a handheld calculator. And about a month or two later, he and his staff came back with an obstacle avoidance game, which was prototyped. And it was LEDs uh, vertically on a screen you were at the bottom operating your LED, you tried to get to the top and avoid the obstacles coming down at you. That was the genesis of the first handheld electronic game. And so we thought about how to theme it and what could that LED be? Could it be a race driver trying to get through other race cars as you head up to the top of the screen? Could it be a football running back trying to get past tacklers? And uh, we tested the concepts with game players uh, we didn't know anything about electronic games at the time. Football was the most uh, impressive new theme. Auto race was a close second. Then it was basketball, baseball, other sports games. And so we decided on auto race. So we themed this as a driver trying to get through other drivers. Took the prototype and some drawings out to all the QB tailors. They loved it or they hated it. They had never seen anything like it. Uh, and they thought it was going to be the new generation of games or they thought we were crazy. But uh, that, that was the first prototype. Auto Race became the first game. Then it led to the whole series of 20 or 20, uh, 20 or 25 Mattel handheld games and started the category. So uh, we did football as the second game because we had a better display and better concept coming on down the road for football. So Auto Race was the first, then football, basketball, baseball, all the rest. Uh, that eventually led to Mattel getting into a television, but our gratification was from starting the handheld game category, which became a $400 million category for Mattel. So you didn't have anything to do with the uh, television part. Uh, that actually, you're saying, came afterward, after your involvement. Well, I was, I, I was asked by the heads of Mattel if I wanted to take over the Intellivision effort, but I was having a lot of fun as new category market guy because we were doing electronic bikes, new forms of roller skates. We were trying to get into the traditional game business and compete with Parker Brothers and Bradley, Ideal Shop at Lakeside. We had a few neat games. Uh, one was based on, uh, were, some of them were based on licenses. Uh, and the problem there was 
there were only about 10 few retailers, Toys R Us, Sears, Pennies, Woolworths. They had all the game manufacturers they needed to fill their game shop. They said, why the heck do we need games from Mattel? So we had some great big games, but we never got enough acceptance by the retailers. Uh, so I wanted to stay doing new things in all categories. So I handed over the reins to a guy named Jeff Rockless, who took over in television and uh, continued expanding the, uh, the handheld game business. And I got contacted by uh, Arnold Greenberg and Leonard Greenberg, the founders or sons of the founders and chairman and CEO of Coleco. Coleco at the time was uh, mainly a uh, hobby company and a uh, for, you know, a standing table game company. They had ride-ons. They wanted to become a big factor in the toy business. They chose electronic games. They ripped off, as you might recall, Football One from Mattel and did a game called Electronic Quarterback. They asked me if I wanted to come in and be their first real head of marketing and expand the whole handheld game and video game line. It was a private company. They offered me stock. It was a rare opportunity to have sort of entrepreneur and who was successful, put Coleco on the map. And uh, about three years later, we had expanded the handhelds to head to head to those small miniature standing arcade games that were about eight inches tall, which were Pac-Man, this is Pac-Man, Donkey Kong. Uh, we introduced ColecoVision with Donkey Kong. The only way you could get Donkey Kong for the home was by buying ColecoVision. So we got a lot of converts from Atari and Intellivision. And then we discovered something called Cabbage Patch down in Georgia. And Xavier Roberts, the founder, who was selling $300 handmade dolls for years out of an office that he called a hospital uh, with the uh, mantra and myth that these were not dolls, they were kids that were born from a cabbage patch. We got the rights of Coleco for all the mass market, under $50 cabbage patch dolls. And between that and what was going on with ColecoVision and the handhelds, Coleco became the fastest growing New York Stock Exchange company in 1982. Stock went from about 7 to 70 in a very short time. And by then, I was at uh, Epix, trying to turn Epix around and expand it from a strategy computer game maker. So we had a booth set up at the CES show right near uh, the Coleco booth so I could watch the crowds and theoretically decide exactly when the right time to sell my Coleco stock would be based on the phenomenal success that they were having at the CES show. I was off by one day. I didn't catch the high, but I came close to it. So, uh, those were the uh, heady days at Mattel and Coleco. Great times being involved in the start of the handhelds and the second and third generation of, uh, of game consoles. Okay, so from uh, uh, Epix, they, uh, Jack Tramiel came calling and he managed to lure you away from them to come to Atari Corp. Right. Um, Epix was an interesting uh, business model and business study. As you guys might recall, or your father and your older brothers might tell you, in the early 80s, uh, video games were dead for about three or four years. Uh, I, I look at that as just wear out, and we had saturated the whole market for video games. Other people like to argue that the games weren't any good and the players went away from them. But I think it was just a natural progression. So computer games got popular on the Commodore 64, on the Atari, uh, and on Apple. And uh, Epix was a company making very serious strategy games, simulations for uh, C64, Atari, IBM. And the charter I got when I joined the company from the venture capitalist who funded it was, can you make it into a mass market uh, company? And let's get some games that are more mass market oriented. So uh, I and the guys there looked at the, you know, the basic games that were very strategic, and we said, let's create a new category. Let's create a category for the computer games, and let's call it action strategy games, where you have the mass appeal of action, like an other race game or like an, a character-oriented action game. But there's a point of the game where you have to stop and make decisions. In an auto race game, we came out with Pit Stop, uh, are your tires wearing out? Are you going to lose them? Are you running out of gas? Are you going to stop, gas up, get new tires? Or are you going to try one more lap around the track? So we decided 
we do action games where we retain the strategic simulations, which was Epics' old name, strategy, emphasis to some extent, by having key strategic decisions. So we try implementing that in all our games. The, uh, as you might recall, our motto and emblem for the company became Rodin's thinker, like this, but we put a joystick in his hand. So it was including strategy from the old epics with games like Temple of Abshai and incorporating uh, action in a game like Pit Stop or Jumpman or Summer Games, Winter Games, California Games, which we thought about as a great way to build value into computer games and had the action of a multi-game game uh, about a year before the Olympics, uh, whenever it was in the mid-80s, uh, started. So uh, epics went from a uh, $4 million losing money company uh, quickly to about a $20 million making money company by getting it into the action, more and more categories. We had an educational category, we had driving, we had Jumpman, uh, ran, the Glover was about to develop that. And we took on uh, basically electronic arts, data east, data most, spectrum hotabyte. And I've learned recently that uh, every Friday when Trip Hawkins had his electronic arts product planning meetings with his key guys, he would be always upset that Epics, this little, uh, you know, nothing company, was outselling electronic arts uh, in action computer games. So uh, I love to hear that. I kid trip about it. There's some other trip stories that I'll tell you when we get to the, the city days. Okay. Uh, so you, you, were talking, you were talking about Atari. Sorry. So yeah. Jack and Sam, Jack and Sam Tramel, uh, Jack, you know, the, the tough guy who ran Commodore and built it from nothing with a C64, as you know, bought Atari from Time Warner for no cash, took over a lot of debt, and his concept was make Atari into a Commodore 64 type popular product. It was 10 years after the Commodore 64, and he came out with a computer that was low price, powerful, and for the common man. Hence, he developed a lot of time developing the Atari ST. My role was initially to help with sales and marketing there, but mainly to bring back the video games. So basically, between you and I, he could get income from the video games to pump into uh, development and manufacturing and software for the Atari ST, which was supposed to be the new popular price computer that was going to save the world and jack second success in that area. So, uh, as you know, we lowered the price of the Atari 2600 to under $50. We got a wonderful uh, musical commercial to that effect. Uh, we developed software and tried to encourage other people to develop software for the 2600. And at the same time, we finished off development of the 7800 and tried to encourage uh, software participation there. Not a lot of video game guys wanted to develop product for Atari. Uh, they didn't have a good feeling about Jack, perhaps, or that we were squeezing them too much, or that they were going to invest too much. And so what I ended up doing, and all the hot product was monopolized by Nintendo. Nintendo had the lock on all the hot arcade games. They had exclusive agreements with the arcade companies in Japan, so nobody else, neither Sega at that time or Atari, could get the rights to the hot video game titles. So it was my concept to go to my former buddies in the computer game area, uh, like Alan Miller uh, at um, help, um, Accolade, and try to license the hot arcade, uh, the hot computer games for the 7800. So we got Hardball from Accolade, we got some of the other hot titles from Data East, Data Most, and uh, I confronted that same problem at Sega later on. We couldn't get the hot arcade titles for the home market because Nintendo had a lock on them. A suit took place over that, but you know Nintendo defended it successfully. But at Sega, the idea was let's get the personalities, let's get the Joe Montanas, uh, the Tommy Lasortas, the Michael Jacksons, the Pat Rileys, and come out with a better game system. I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, but it was the same kind, same kind of thought process. How do we get good software that's unique, that's licensable, if we can't get the hot arcade titles? So I did it with going to the computer game guys and asking for licenses on known product they had uh, at Epics, I'm sorry, at uh, Atari with the 7800, 
And then when I got to Sega, we had the same problem. So we came out with that tough competitive stance, as you might recall. Genesis does what Nintendo don't. Uh, we had a more powerful system. We had one, uh, one year lead time on Nintendo. We didn't have a 16-bit system. And we went after the hot personalities. And to demonstrate that, we went after Joe Montana. We were in a fight, which I didn't know about until Howard Lincoln told me afterwards, uh, with Nintendo. And it became a money battle and a uh, personality battle. Uh, Montana agreed to sign with Genesis. We started developing the Joe Montana football game. I remember giving him a check for $1.2 million, which was his advance at our press conference when we announced to the world that we had Joe Montana. Joe showed up in his usual pair of blue jeans and a dirty t-shirt. Don't tell him I said dirty. And uh, he took the check, put it in his back pocket. And ever since then, I've just pictured, because he was rolling in money those days from being so successful on his own with licensing. I pictured him going home that night putting the blue jeans in the, in the washing machine, forgetting that there was a check for $1.2 million, and I just envisioned him, you know, taking the pants out the next day, either not caring that the check was shredded or not even remembering that he got it. But as it turned out, he earned $3.5 million on the license with uh, Genesis. So uh, the Japanese who thought I was nuts and uh, didn't agree with my request to pay him that much, I suspect were happy when we had revenue that generated three and a half million for him in licensing fees and a lot of volume for um, for Sega. Your turn, Marty. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, sort of in relation to that uh, to that segue, basically, uh, you at one point towards the end of your time at Atari, uh, Sega, I understand, approached uh, Atari about doing the Genesis or having having Atari uh, uh, have the uh, North American rights to the Genesis. Absolutely right. Uh, I remember being in the conference room, being very excited because I had spoken to Dave Rosen at Sega, who later became my U.S. boss. He founded Sega after the Korean War and stayed in Japan, as you might know, and got into the pinball business and all that. Dave Rosen uh, approached me with um, Arakawa, uh, or do I mean Nakayama, um, uh, whoever the Sega president was, the non-Nintendo, and, and one of my bosses, and uh, Arakawa. And uh, we didn't want to put the money into actually becoming the marketing arm behind this new system that they had developed, which became the, uh, you know, the, gen the Genesis. Uh, we were doing too much on the own in Japan. They didn't picture themselves as strong marketers in the U.S. for the home systems or the home business. They had a nice arcade business. They didn't want to you know, invest in the time, people, and money that was necessary to launch their own system against Nintendo. So I got really excited because Dave called me and said, would you be interested in Atari? And I was tremendously interested because we were playing catch up with the 7800, with the 2600, and with something called the XE game system, which Jack sort of made us do, which was a low-end computer with the ST, and Commodore 64 type power, and we were positioning it as the best game system and the best low price computer. None of our consumers believed you could have the best computer and the best game system, and we didn't have great software support, so that never made it. So when Dave Rosen came along and said, how would Atari like to have a 16-bit state of art system, I was excited, the guys I worked with in the games division were excited, and uh, we went into a meeting with Jack eventually, and we discussed what it would cost for Atari to license uh, the you know new system from Sega. And since Jack was a table stomping, fist stomping, uh, crew chef type character at times, and never wanted anyone to get the better of him, and never believed in paying a lot of money for anything. You can imagine how the discussion went when it came to how much the Japanese wanted for the new system and how much Jack was willing to let Atari offer. So it broke down. Jack didn't really believe in the games anyhow. Uh, his only interest was in maybe I could generate more money for the ST. As you might recall, the ST never got very good distribution. Atari had to purchase Federated Electronics Store as a bankrupt chain of stores out of LA because Jack felt, okay, if I won't get distribution from uh, the guys at the Best Buys and Wards and Sears and Toys R Us electronic boutiques of the world, 
then I'll go out and buy my own retail electronics store. And like the ratio shack, I don't have to worry about any of these buyers. We'll just put it in our own stores. Well, I'm sure he's impressed by what Steve Jobs is now doing with the Apple stores, but unfortunately, we didn't have that success uh, at Federated. But anyhow, uh, the genesis, as you put out, Marty, got turned down by Atari. That's when Sega decided what the hell. They invest a modest amount of money and love Uncle Dallas. Uh, did I lose you? Or I'm still with you. No, you're still with us. Okay. No. Okay. And so uh, that led to Sega starting to do it themselves. I left Atari after three and a half years. The stock, which had gone public while I was there, went from zero to twelve, and unfortunately went back down towards zero. Uh, but anyhow, I was there three and a half years was somewhat gratified that we had brought back, uh, in some ways, the popular price video game system, 2600, and supplied some money to Atari. So I decided I would uh, take a sabbatical and go around the world, which I wanted to do for a long time, and do something different when I got back. But I got back, and Dave Rosenbaum and said, OK, you're back. You don't really want to leave the video game industry. We need someone to start. Uh, the Sega U.S. effort in a big way with Genesis, and so uh, I went to Sega. Okay, now, uh, as a lot of people are not familiar with, you actually created a whole foundation for the, what became the success of the Genesis in the early 90s to make it the dominant system it was. Um, we like to think so. We had to uh, start the whole development group in the U.S. We hired again Ken Ball, Fazer, who you might know, whose two sons have been in the business too. Ken had been a head of development at several companies, and I uh, hired him, and we built a whole internal development team in the U.S. that became hundreds of developers. We also worked with outside developers, and we had to devise a whole product plan software for Genesis. So we went through the normal, sophisticated, disciplined way, which a lot of people aren't aware of, where you look at different genres, racing, sports, shooting, strategy, education, driving, and we made sure that we had games being developed in each of those categories. Uh, Japan continued with the cartoon characters, which they were very good at, uh, in developing cartoon animated uh, personality type games. But we took over sports and we took over some of the other categories in terms of development, and we were internally we're developing at any one time genre, uh, different genres and different games and genres while we were paying outside developers of whom we used about five or six good ones. Richard Frick down in Southern California and uh, it's been a while so I don't remember some of the others but some of the leading independent, independent developers. Uh, at the same time we had to decide on a competitive approach. We introduced Genesis. What better than Genesis does what Nintendo? We became the first game company. I used to love competitive advertising back when I was in grocery products and personal products and Lever Brothers type stuff. So we did the first uh, competitive approach for a video game console. Uh, we had done a competitive commercial at Lego, as you might recall, for Electronic Quarterback, where uh, Electronic Quarterback was a personality dressed as the Lego game, uh, uh, there was a competitor guy dressed as the Mattel game, and the Coleco guy kept talking about what he had uh, for electronic quarterback in features that the Mattel guy didn't. The Mattel guy started drinking. So I was involved, I guess, in the first competitive hand commercial, which was pretty successful, done by an author called Richard Edwards in New York for Coleco. And then we had an agency in LA, and we got them moving in the direction of the competitive approach for Genesis. And so Genesis does what Nintendo became the approach. We introduced it at the uh, CES show, as you might recall, with giant monitor screens with the commercials blaring, and our personalities, Joe Montana, Pat Riley, uh, talking about us having uh, software that was personality oriented, but we couldn't get the cartoon licenses. Um, and an anecdote is that uh, um, we were a little bit late developing the football game with Joe Montana. We had to have it ready for the right kind of introduction, introduction at Christmas. Uh, it was being developed by Mediagenic, for us, believe it or not, when a guy named Bruce Davis, Mediagenic being the old Activision in one of its iterations. Uh, 
Bruce, Bruce had uh, a team of good programmers that were busy working hard to develop a great football game for us, and we kept being a little bit naive and thinking the game was further ahead than it was. We learned in October the game would never be finished in uh, November or December. We needed it. The Japanese had given me the million two to get to Montana. We needed it to introduce Genesis in a big way. So I ate humble pie one day, and I picked up the phone, and I called Trip Hawkins, and I said, Trip, is there any way that you have a backup football game to Madden? And I know you're trying to get a good deal on a license with Sega to do Genesis games for uh, very little money or no money. Maybe we can do something together, work together. And he said, well, we do have a backup Madden football game, and uh, maybe we can get it ready for you. Uh, not by Christmas, but by you know early January, and so uh, your audience will now know as few people do. But the first John Madden football game actually started as I mean the first John Montana football game for Genesis actually started as a backup John Madden football game, and to an extent, Trip saved us on the timing of the introduction. But I think we saved him a lot of money on the license for his Genesis software. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, on one hand, I took care of the other. Um, anyhow, go ahead, ask, ask the way. I'm sorry to be giving these long stories. But. Uh, it's no problem. We're actually going to go to the audience for a couple questions, and, and then we're going to have to uh, call an end to the conversation, because unfortunately we ran over with the previous one. We were having technical difficulties with the previous interview. So uh, we'll, uh, if you can't hear the question, I'll repeat it for you uh, so you can hear it, but we're going to take one from the audience. And, go ahead. First question, right here. Um, as I understand, you left Sega and, and Tom Kalinske replaced you. Is that correct? Uh, did you hear yes, that? Yeah, yes, uh, yes, it is. Tom and I have worked together at Mattel. He's a good guy. He's bright. He's a very good toy guy. I was given the mantra of Yakman Dai, uh, which you know, for Japanese means a million units. And every morning when I woke up, I was supposed to pray for a million units of Genesis. It was unrealistic because uh, the Nintendo users were not going to convert that quickly. Uh, so I agreed to disagree with the Japanese. Tom came in and, uh, you know, basically, uh, in the opinion of me and a lot of people, uh, finished the development and building effort. And then in the summer of uh, whatever it was, um, when was it? In the summer of 90 or 91, uh, we really caught steam with Genesis after I'd left and started really competing well with uh, Nintendo. But I interrupted your question, so please continue. Yeah, my, my question was, um, had you stayed with Sega, uh, would you have done anything differently for the Saturn development that was kind of headed by Japan? Well, we, you know, we always wanted to have a hot piece of software to introduce with any new system, any place I had been in the business, because as you know, software sells the hardware. So the best example was Coleco. You know, one people thought Coleco was crazy to get into battle against Atari and uh, and Mattel because we had never had hardware. But we introduced ColecoVision with Donkey Kong for the first six months. You could only buy Donkey Kong for the home systems if you bought ColecoVision. Then we made it available to Atari and Mattel. So it's a long way of saying uh, we wanted. We wanted Japan to come up with a hot piece of cartoon animation, a cartoon type Donkey Kong Pac-Man software, or anybody to come up with it. So that could be sold with Genesis uh, at the introduction or near the introduction. So Tom uh, you know, managed to finally convince the Japanese. Uh, they developed Sonic. Sonic, uh, we thought, was a little bit ridiculous as a character, because who in the US had heard of you know, a character like Sonic, but it turned out to be a great game. That packed in with Genesis, when Genesis was getting awareness, uh, sort of turned the corner, got trial of Genesis with people of Sonic, and uh, that got it going. So I agree with, you know, having developed the best possible software in order to move Genesis ahead, uh, because it is software that sells hardware. So would I have done anything differently? In that regard, no, I think that was the right move. Uh, would I have done anything to sustain the life of Genesis and maybe get into a 32-bit system sooner? Uh, 
you know, maybe. I always love hardware, and I love the idea of constantly trying to make hardware more interesting. Uh, when we've had the smarts of uh, Steve Jobs and what he's done at Apple in entertainment, who knows? But uh, I think I would have put continuing emphasis on new hardware, not just software to support Genesis. Because as you know, you've got to have the next best thing, uh, you know, every two or three years in the game area. And if you're not, you get left behind. Okay, one more question. Did you ever consider the NEC PC Engine and its Americanized cousin, the Turbo Graphics, uh, any sort of competition? I know that your your focus was on uh, going toe to toe with Nintendo, but I was just curious if you thought that they had any chance in the American market. Uh, I remember that I remember that there was competition, and I remember you know the money and the effort and the guys they brought in to run very U.S. division, but, um, you know, you often can have a very good product technologically, but if you don't market it, if you don't have great software, if you don't have a big name with a consumer, and you're up against the Nintendos and Segas and Sonys of the world, uh, it's very tough for someone like that to break in. So I think we had respect for, you know, the strength of their hardware, but it's not about that. One of the biggest battles that had to be won as you developed any new system was you had to get support from the independent game developers, software developers, because a lot of good software came from the independents. And they knew they had to make an investment, so they very carefully picked what new hardware system they'd support. So NEC and some of the others, even Trip when he came out with Help Me Marty, um, 3DO. What was this? 3DO. I'm sorry? 3DO. 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 Uh, you know, if you don't have the hot new games to support the hardware, you're not going to have a good launch. And uh, that's, you know, might be unfortunate, but that's the way the world works. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We could, we could keep going the entire night with you. Uh, I know, because there's so many, <laughs> so many interesting things that we all want to hear. Uh, and I feel bad that the previous technical difficulties of the previous conversation cut it short. But I want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this and talking to everybody at the show here. I want to thank all your attendees and all the game players that you, uh, you know, write such useful information, reviews, comments for, and uh, I'll be happy to be around for the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th anniversary of the show. And if we tell a story in 15 minutes of each of those sessions, maybe by about 2090, we'll be finished with all the stories. <laughs> so you say you want to talk again next year? Are we out for that? Well, I'm not going to allow the guy before me to go 20 minutes over. <laughs> no if, you, if you promise me, you'll cut him off. And by then, I'll know how to do Skype myself. Uh, you know, all us old dinosaurs might not keep up with technology. Who we pretend to know about it. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to talk to you guys again. No problem. You have a promise on that. And thank you very much again for your time. Okay. Have a good one.